Welcome to the American Diversity Report podcasts, where we interview diverse change makers and creative innovators. I'm Deborah Levine, editor of the American Diversity Report and your host. And with me today is someone very special. Her name is Gloria Romero. She is author of Just Not That Likable, <laughs> The Price All Women Pay for Gender, and she is also a retired California state senator and the Democratic majority leader of the California state Senate. You've been busy, Gloria. I have, <laughs> along with a lot of other powerful women. Yes, indeed. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started on this journey. Thank you, and thank you to your listeners as well. Um, it's hard to, to really pinpoint exactly when a journey begins. I feel like it, having been born female, being born Latina, uh, it started right from the, the get-go. Uh, but essentially, I, you know, long story short, I became the majority leader of the California State Senate. I championed many issues. California is, you know, by any number of measures, the fifth largest economy in the world. And so, you know, it's a rough and tumble world and being in politics. But I noticed even back then, and even more so now, that there is a bit of a double standard, what we call a likability factor that's applied to women, much more so than men. And we see it in the research that's been done, and even how women leaders, you know, irrespective of the politics, whatever one thinks about their political background, we tend to embrace men as being assertive and decisive in their leaders and they're strong. But when it comes to women, we still tend to fall back on that sugar and spice and everything nice. And, you know, he's assertive, but she's a little bit abrasive. You know, he's demanding, but she's pushy. In other words, you know, basically she becomes the word that rhymes with witch. <laughs> she uh, becomes a bit of a bitch. And so I, I've looked at this, and this is not just something that's going on in our everyday lives, but we find it in the world of corporate America. We find it in the political arena around the world, quite frankly. Uh, and I thought it was time that we address the issue in a volume, and that's what I did. I also also in my career have personally experienced this as well. And I have actually in my own career have filed a gender and age bias suit because I believe it's important for women not just to share the stories, but to actually begin to document the cases so that we have a track record on which we can act. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more on that. You know, having published 15 books, uh, if it's not documented, it never happened. Exactly, exactly. And our voices get lost. And then we continue to look for people like, how do we go? How do we move our way forward? The interesting thing is that there have been cases. And in the book that I wrote, I talk about a historic case that so few of us even know about. And this was the case of trailblazer Ann Hopkins, who actually won the very first U.S. Supreme Court ruling back in 1989 that actually said for the first time that it is gender discrimination. It is unconstitutional. It is against the law for an employer to use stereotypes of gender, femininity or masculinity in making promotion and employment decisions. That was a groundbreaker back in 1989. It paved the way for so many actions to follow. But sadly, so few of us even know about Ann Hopkins. And I wanted to tell her story also in this book that I wrote. Oh, thank you. No, I had not heard of her. And I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, you may or may not know that I was in the very first Women's Liberation March in Manhattan back in 1970 or so. Uh, it's taken a while, has it not? 
It absolutely has. It's taken away. And we've made progress, but we're still far short of the goal. I mean, when we stop and think about even all, even overall women who have advanced politically, we still don't have a U.S. So, uh, a president of the United States of America, although women have tried. Uh, we still don't have the parity in the corporate offices. You know, I point out in the book that there are more, there are more men named John running Fortune 500 companies than women altogether. And so we take a look at it across the board, no matter where we are, we, women are still hitting what we call that glass ceiling. Uh, the, the, when, we, when a few of us are able to break it, it hurts. And those of us who get through then are then still uh, uh, pointed and painted as being, you know, just not that nice. You know, we're not, you know, we, we don't laugh, we cackle. Uh, we don't speak decisively, we yell. And so I go through and talk about all the double standards and what we need to do to really change that so that we can, you know, that it shouldn't have to take another 500 years as some project in order to get some semblance of parity in the workforce. Well, I wanna, I wanna talk to you about the advice that you give people, but first, can you tell us a little bit more about the suit that you brought, the legal suit? Um, because uh, of, of legal issues, I can only say so many things, uh, but basically I believe in standing up for oneself. Uh, all I can legally say is that I did uh, recognize a gender and age bias. I took steps to file such. And uh, uh, I, all I can say is the matter has been resolved. Mm -hmm. But I do point out in the book that it's important for women and to think about what steps they will take. Some will actually go through a full trial. Uh, it takes money, it takes resources, it takes a great deal of psychological strength. Uh, others will go through an arbitration process. Others may simply you know, write a blog about it. We've seen women in recent years take different steps. And I applaud each and every action it's because it does depend upon what their own personal backgrounds and resources may be. But I think though, at the end of the day, it's important to document because as you've pointed out, without the documentation, it becomes invisible. It does. Yes, unfortunately it does. So tell us a little bit more about the advice that you have for women in this book. First of all, document your story, tell your story. I know it can be difficult. And even though, you know, it's been three decades, think about it, three decades since the Supreme Court ruled that it is unconstitutional, it is illegal for a, uh, a board, an employer to basically tell a woman as they did Anne Hopkins in the famous Price Waterhouse lawsuit that brought forward this law, it, uh, they basically told her that she wasn't feminine enough, uh, that she should even take charm classes, uh, <laughs> that she acted like a man, even though she was this top performing corporate executive, she was still held to standards that are very stereotypical of what women look like. In my own career, and I can say this, I have been told by the suits that, you know, I come out of the legislature where women are expected to be strong, but that I now work in a workplace where women are weak. And so there's a mismatch. So these are things that we're hearing even 30 years after the historic uh, case at the Supreme Court, even when we've seen women run for office in this country, when we've seen women around the world being elected to their top positions, we're still telling women to be quiet, to shut up, to not say anything. So I think it's very important for women, and we're usually told this, being basically being told that we're not likable, that we've got to behave in a certain way. And so uh, the first thing that I really tell women is, you know, document. And then we really do need to get over that need to be liked. And that can be hard because so much of social media, it's like, you know, thumbs up, we like something or we send a little heart. And as girls, we're often told that we want to be liked, we want to be loved. And that's wonderful when we are, but we shouldn't have to play a subservient role in order to be respected, regarded, and liked. And so that's the most important thing is really be true to yourself 
And don't worry about being liked. Worry about making sure that you are respected and valued and stepping up and stepping out is really, I think, the most important area we can do for ourselves. How true, how true. And many of us learn that the hard way. <laughs> Absolutely. But yet we find, and I found as well too, when I started writing the book, uh, that I, I talked with other women and other, so many other women said, oh, that happened to me. They called me a witch. They called me that. They told me I was too loud. They told me I had to, you know, that I was abrasive and that I was rubbing people the wrong way and blah, blah, blah. And behaviors that are expected of men in leadership to lead, we take away and we restrict. And it really goes back to how we socialize still, boys and girls, and basically encouraging girls to be strong and to be leaders. But when we do lead and we are strong, then we find that, that bias that still says, oh, but you're a girl, you're supposed to act differently. And it's amazing that after all this time, we still face it. And so I call upon not only women, but men as well to be allies in this movement. Uh, it can't be women who are just the gender police, uh, but it's important to really document, to highlight. I believe, like, for example, you play a very important role in talking with your listeners in the books that you write, talking about what are the impacts when we basically tell half the world's population that if we're not likable, defined by whose standards, then we're not worthy of being leaders. And that really, it, it's, it's profound and it's around the world and we need to move forward to change it. Otherwise, we're going to you know, still keep getting these uh, laments by too many women. Absolutely. And one of the things that I've found is that the older I get, the more I really don't care whether I'm likable or not. <laughs> I share that with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can remember, oh gosh, writing something about um, the power of women, of older women in particular. Not only are they the the sort of reservoir of so much information from family and community, right? They are treasures because they speak their minds. Right. And there is that famous uh, quote, uh, something to the effect that uh, well-behaved women rarely make history. So it's okay to step out of our shoes and to basically dance to our own tune, lead our way, be authentic, and to speak up. And I'm not saying being like tyrannical, a devil, but it doesn't matter. I mean, basically, when we lead, we are told too often that we are misbehaving and so therefore not meritorious. So I agree with you that uh, uh, women of a certain age, women as we age, uh, can really lead the way in talking about what's at stake and why it's important to not hold on to that desire to be loved and cradled and adored and to really just do the right thing. And it's liberating and it's good for all women going forward. Yes, it is good for a lot of folks, not just ourselves. We're setting a model. We're changing the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And women have the power to do that, really, because they are so embedded in the community. Just like you, you must have an amazing number of contacts. Right. And, and I think... Um, it's important. I think young women want to hear the message as well, um, because we still get so many mixed messages. In the book, I talk about even though we've seen great progress, we still find so much gender stereotyping in what we see, for example, in games, uh, online, literature. Uh, I talk about Hollywood and the depictions of women and then women as we age also how we get uh, put into particular roles and, and told how to behave. Uh, women are told that we are over the hill at a much earlier age than our men. And I give a special shout out to the uh, actress, uh, Gina Davis, who at USC has really done some amazing work looking at all of these biases in the world of sports. 
we also find that when when there are outbursts on the uh, you know on the court, women tend to get uh, treated in a very different way. Like it's just not ladylike to have a emotional outburst, and yet we can look at male tennis stars and oh, we just sort of expect it for the men to behave this way. So I, I write a lot about also the diversity of women. And even though it is something that all women face, the, the, it's even becomes even more intense when we take a look at women of color. African-American women are often depicted as being angry, militant, and so therefore uh, not that likable. Latina women are oftentimes depicted as fiery, uh, the Asian American woman is told that she becomes this tiger mom, watch out. And so we find all of these stereotypes, you know, women as we age, uh, we are told that we are now subjected to menopausal mood swings and to watch out for, you know, swing in behavior. And so it doesn't matter our age or color. It's just sort of at a certain point still in our history. And the research continues to show this, that women are underrepresented. And when we do get represented in these critical areas of whether it's corporate America or in the political arena, we're still subjected to those old biases that look to pull us down, prevent the promotion, and make it difficult for the, um, you know, the, the, the line of women to come forward. So it's important for all of us to really recognize it. I hope that there would be greater gender bias workshops throughout our workforce, really talking about this and what we can do to recognize it and then overcome. Otherwise, we're gonna have that great disparity going forward that we've witnessed and no change. Uh, I'm so sorry, but I think you're right. I think that that is very much in the cards these days. We are living in tumultuous times, and a lot of folks are pushing back on this, right? Right, right. We still continue to find the pushback, but it's important for our voices to break through. Yes, indeed. Uh, let me ask you, um, how many years were you a senator? I was in the legislature for, I believe, 12 years. I was in the California State Assembly. And then in a special election, I ran for the Senate. It's interesting, when I ran for the Senate in a special election, there was another male assembly member who wanted to run for that seat. Uh, it's a democracy. Anybody can run. And I was told, I mean, I remember this vividly. I was told that I should sit down and just wait my turn, you know, basically defer to him. And that wasn't that long ago, quite frankly, when this occurred. And so, you know, even in the modern era, when we have capable, capable women who are ready to run, we still get the messaging. Even when I was in the legislature, I remember being told, because, you know, as women and, and men, candidates, we've got to raise money. You hold the fundraisers, you have to raise money to, you know, pay for the campaign that you're running. I remember literally being advised, and this was by a respected uh, professional who worked with uh, clients in Sacramento to raise money. It was a woman. I remember her telling me that I should hike up my skirt and be more flirtatious as a way to attract money to my camp. I thought, my God, I'm not running to, to represent prostitutes in California. I'm <laughs> running to be a, an assembly member, a legislature. But I was literally told this. I doubt that men were told to raise their pants so we could see their <laughs> hairy legs. And so you get this all across the board. I could write a whole other book about experiences of being female while leading. But in the meantime, this book will have to suffice because it tells a lot of stories that I think so many women will experience and face. Oh my goodness. I am so appreciate that you have written this, especially at this time when um, I'm getting messages about how uh, people are seeing that women are supposed to have children, stay at home, cook dinner, clean the house, and not take leadership roles. Right, right. And I'm a mom. 
Uh, I told my daughter right from the get go, look, I'm not going to be super mom. I'm not the world's best cook. She will tell you that. But it was my daughter who actually was the first person who said, mom, you've got to write a book. You've got to tell this story. And in the book, I actually have some little vignettes about being a mother with her as well. And some of the some of the advice I gave her on feminism and really just standing up for yourself along the way. Uh, but you're right, we continue to get these messages. And I think do, women do feel bombarded. On one hand, you know, we are told we've got to, you know, bring home the bacon and fly, you know, fry it up in the pan and do everything and never burn it and all of that. Um, but there are particular challenges. And, and that's where I do think that we can't, uh, we, we can't put ourselves down. We can't, uh, there's enough criticism out there towards us. So let it slide. We've got to borrow some of that Teflon that so many other men seem to enjoy. And I really think to choose what's best for you, do the right thing for you, move forward, but always speak out when there is an injustice or a wrong, because if it's happening to you, I will guarantee you it's happening to so many other women around you. And until we start raising our voices and basically like the Wizard of Oz, picking up the curtain and basically exposing what's behind that, it's never going to get better. We need to, to be very visible and uh, be very careful about how we, um, uh, manage what is thrown at us uh, and deal with it uh, in ways that help not only ourselves, but those who come after us or who are around us. I, I created something called the Women's Council on Diversity back in uh, 2001. It just, there just needed to be a way to have conversations about this across cultural boundaries, generations, and with the community as a whole. And to be able to share stories like this, so powerful. And really something that you created that was even a bit ahead of its time in terms of thinking about the timing and the theme and the embrace of diversity and the recognition that when we do have diverse uh, gatherings and workforces, there's great value. There can be conflict. There can be different ways of, of looking at the world. But the point is to recognize that we can, if we, you know, if we listen to each other and if we're able to pick out the best ideas, succeed more so. So diversity can be frightening to many. It can be challenging. It can there can be rife with conflict. But the point is to really recognize that diversity represents all of us. It does indeed. And there was an interesting issue about the, that you just brought up about being uh, ahead of the times, right? So many people, women who are leaders will find that they are at the cutting edge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, ahead of their times. And the kind of pushback they get ask me how I know this, right, can be monumental. How do they deal with that? Um, I, I just think it's important to really, I think, applaud oneself uh, to say that you are taking a first step. Uh, we celebrate firsts in this country. And to me, being a first, being cutting edge, being ahead of our time really means that there's a sense of vision and a sense of daring and a sense of risk, but a sense of confidence that we're going to take that step. So to be uh, ahead of our time, I think, is not only, it's not just a measure of time and the era in which we live. I think it really speaks to the attributes of strength and courage and bravery and, and, and a willingness, a sense of adventure as well. I mean, imagine, I always think about Amelia Earhart to get in a plane, you know, <laughs> back in a day when, I mean, we can imagine it was rickety, rickety, rick, but to think about the, the adventure of it all. And, um, I, you know, I, I think it's just important for us to know that you know, we, we always talk about, you know, that the, the journey begins with the first step. And the truth of it is, we don't know where that step is going to lead us, what the next steps are. But I think that it's important for us as women, especially to embrace 
uh, the unknown as well, and to to make our path in the world, to travel that road less traveled, uh, to be the first one to peer into a, a forest and discover what might be there, and then to take our daughters and our sisters and others with us. So I, I embrace uh, the challenge, and I think that to a great extent, any woman who's ever gone where nobody has gone before, they are to be really being held up as a symbol of courage and confidence because they have to be in order to take those steps. Thank you. That is so helpful. I hope our audience is listening because I bet there are a lot of people out there, a lot of women who are wondering, should I do this? Uh, can I do this? Uh, and I think they need to really pay attention. They are trailblazers, creative innovators in the making. So true. Yeah. Is there anything that you would like to add that we have not yet discussed? Um, no, I just want to thank you um, and your listeners as well to take those steps. I'd really like to encourage uh, your listeners to go to Amazon.com or to your local bookstore and request uh, a copy of my book, Just Not That Likeable, The Price All Women Pay for Gender Bias. It's also available on audio tape and I recorded it myself. So while you're driving to work, you can listen to the book or you can do it the old fashioned way, you know, sit down somewhere and read it probably between workloads, right? <laughs> uh, but it's a fun read. It's packed with data and information and court cases and examples. All of it is um, research based, but it's a fun read, but it is a call. It's a challenge to women to really stand up and to take this moment in our time to challenge the likability penalty that all women pay and that a US Supreme Court you know, wrote about 30 years ago and so few of us even know. So it was fun writing the book, it needed to be said. I'm glad I've said it and now it's sharing it with your readers and listeners and, and really men and women throughout the world. Well, audience, you've heard it here. You have your task to go and look up this wonderful book. And we hope to talk with you again, Gloria, as time goes on to see what the response has been and what your next steps are. Um, it's amazing journey that you've taken. And I bet in many ways, the best is yet to come. It would be an honor to return. Thank you so much. Thank you and thank you audience. Well, it's been wonderful and we'll, we'll look forward to seeing everybody again in the next one. Gloria, thank you very much. If you'll stay on, I have a few things I wanna ask. All right, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely.